Hello and welcome to Linux Lads. I am Shane and with me today is Amalith. Hello. Hello, how have, how have you been? Good, good. Um, you'll notice it's just the two of us again. We're kind of doing this a lot lately, I think. <laughs> We're just um, pairing up recently. Um, but you know, it's that time of year, people are going on holidays and whatnot. So uh, I think we'll probably be back to uh, the normal quartet sometime next month. <laughs> hopefully. Um, <laughs> hopefully. But it is it is nice to mix it up, I suppose, and just have the, like these two one-on-ones every now and again. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, we didn't take a summer break this year, so that's why people are absent so often because everyone, everyone, everyone needs their holidays. So we'll get straight into it. Um, I finally got around to setting up my ADSB receiver. Um, I did it today, actually. Uh, I said I was going to do it like two, three weeks ago, but <laughs> you know, life. And that was actually a very fun process. Uh, a little bit frustrating at times, but it was uh, it was very satisfying. Then when I finally saw the flight data on in my browser window, it was unbelievably fasc- uh, fascinating. Basically, just for those who don't know, essentially what you can do is you can download an image for a Raspberry Pi from Flight Radar Twenty Four, which tracks flight data on a on an app that you can get for Android and iOS and, and browser as well. And you just put this image on a Pi and you hook up an ADSB dongle, which is essentially just like a, almost like a, a three, a 4G or 5G dongle uh, with a, like a wire and an aerial attached to it that you s- stick out on the roof. And it uh, basically sends the flight telemetry back to Flight Radar 24. Um, and in return for sending them your, your telemetry, uh, you get uh, like a souped up business account that's worth like $500 a year or something. So I have all the flight data now, <laughs> which is lovely. But the process of getting it set up, like it wasn't straightforward, not not because of the actual software itself or anything. But what, what I had to do was, once I got it set up, I just did it here on the desk uh, just to get it up and running. Um, and it was already detecting things like 30, 40 nautical miles away, which was really cool, actually. So then it was time to put it into production, put it up in the attic. We fortunately we have like uh, powerpoints up in the attic, so um, it w- I could actually power the Pi up there, and everything didn't have to trail like extension cords or anything all over the place. So uh, yeah, I brought it up there. However, the Wi-Fi doesn't quite reach into the attic and put in my SSID, put in my like Wi-Fi password and everything into the into the Pi configuration, blah blah blah. And yeah, it just wasn't working. So I was like, oh crap. So then I had to go on a bit of an odyssey to root out like a power line adapter that I had in a box somewhere, Uh, set that up, hooked it up to the Pi, still wasn't working, still wasn't getting any data over the network, uh, like the home network. So I I realized, I actually learned a a few other things along the way that were nothing to do with what I was actually doing. Those um, power line adapters, I thought you just have to like press like the pair button because we've got like brick walls in this house, so there's no chance of drilling like it's just Mm -hmm. yeah it's terrible Uh, and i have like the combo ones that have like ethernet ports and also repeat the wi-fi in a in another room and like a dead spot in the house but uh what i didn't realize about these power line adapters is when you press the pair button on like the home kind of adapter and then the you know the extended one Mm -hmm. whatever the one that's not next to the router basically the uh you have to press pair on all three of them because i have one that has like a ethernet uh going to my pc here in the office um Mm -hmm. That one stopped working when I paired the one up in the attic. And I was like pulling my hair out for like half an hour. Like I didn't understand what was going wrong. I didn't actually understand that you had to like pair all three of them at the same time to put them all on the same kind of network. Uh, I thought if you just pair the ex- the additional one, then it would just like join the other two in like in like a network. But no, you have to you have to press pair on all three uh, adapters uh, within within the space of two minutes. Um, so I, yeah, so Google helped me with that because <laughs> uh, I, I felt so stupid when I finally realized that. Well, your expectation is, has been my experience with, they're called mesh points and they basically do the same thing. You can join a bunch of access points in a mesh and they sort of repeat each other's signal. And with those, you can add them one by one without having to pair all of them within a particular time range. Yeah, exactly. It seemed well. The, these aren't like top of the range kind of things. They're, they're like T, TP Link AV six hundred something like that. Um, so so then you know they're mid range kind of hardware. They're, I don't think they're like amazing, but they do the tr- they do the trick. Um, they do limit your uh, speeds somewhat. To what extent, I'm not sure. I haven't actually done a proper test on that. 
Anyway, I digress. Um, up in the attic. <laughs> what was really interesting about this project is, uh, you know, long story short, I did get it working and I am getting flight data and sending it to Flight Radar 24. But the challenges I came up against were interesting because I didn't realize that the roof itself, because it's literally just like wooden beams and uh, like clay tiles with some sort of like, you know, mesh in between just to stop water getting in and stuff, uh, just for some sort of kind of like insulation. It, it like the signal quality is so much better when you put it just like outside the window because there's mm-hmm. like a small like hatch window that opens like kind of like a flap in the in the attic. What I did was I just I fished the aerial out out there, put it kind of just standing up on a roof tile. Then and I was actually able to close the skylight window uh, and lock it. Um, so there was enough kind of clearance between the window and the frame that I was able to do that, which was surprising. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I it didn't like chop the <laughs> the wire, and then it was like night and day. Like I was getting somewhere between thirty and forty nautical miles of range. I put it outside on the roof, and it like doubled. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. <laughs> what really su- surprised me though was that it really, really needs line of sight. Uh, that's right. really important, and uh, you know, inclement weather, uh, rain, all these things can like really affect it badly um and of course ireland so <laughs> rain's pretty common like i'm looking i actually have the readout here i might have to go back up onto the roof again and adjust the aerial again because it's actually the range is suffering again <laughs> just before i started recording here i went up and i realized it was sitting on its side it had kind of been blown over by the wind because uh, i wrapped it up in a little plastic bag as well because i'm not sure how like badly rain would affect it but i'm not going to take any chances so I just wrapped it in like a little plastic mm-hmm. bag and taped taped it up with some electrical tape. Um, uh, and I managed to like kind of wedge it between the roof tile and like the frame of the window so it would stand upright. Because as soon as it falls on its side in the wind or anything, y- your range just goes to hell. Like I-, I-, I was really, really surprised by how like, uh, by how, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Sensitive? Like precious, yeah, sensitive or precious, like <laughs> the, 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 how precious and sensitive the aerial is. You know, it has to be standing like right up straight and have like a clear line of sight of the of the sky to to see anything. Um, But when I did get it in the right position, like I was seeing planes as far away as like northern England, like southern Wales, which was kind of nuts. Uh, (laughs) And it's like I, I was kind of flabbergasted by that because I was looking at this going, I am tracking an aircraft that's about like over a, like probably 140 nautical miles away. Don't ask me what the difference between a mile and a nautical mile is. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I was like tracking shit like over a sea, you know, because I'm on I'm in Dublin. Obviously, it's on the east coast of Ireland, mm-hmm. and the the side of my house that the aerial is on is like the eastern slope of the roof. So it, basically, the skylight in the attic points out towards Dublin Bay and on the Irish Sea. So um, I, I was ex- I, I kind of knew that it wouldn't have line of sight to the west, so it wouldn't really see too many things coming in from the west, unless they were qu- quite up high, uh, and you could actually see them just over the eave of the roof. But um, yeah, it was really fascinating. Like I learned, I actually learned about so many different things just doing this one project. Like I couldn't believe it. Um, so I'm excited to see what mm-hmm. else I can do with it, because it's already pretty impressive, like what you can do with like, like the, the receiver itself, I think it costs like 40 euro or something uh, plus delivery. Mm-hmm. It really wasn't that expensive. And you can you can get more expensive ones, more powerful ones. So I'm just, uh, I heard on another podcast, I think it was Popey who was talking about this on Linux Matters or something. Um, he said that uh, you can buy amplifiers and you can buy all sorts of extra kit that, that boosts the signal and gives you extra range so mm-hmm. it's like i'm already seeing planes flying over like liverpool and cardiff so uh, like out past the isle of man and everything so what the hell like <laughs> like will i be able to see planes flying over france or something <laughs> you know like <laughs> i was just about to bring those other podcasts up because you said you're sending data to flightradar24.com i mm-hmm. think okay you I think you can also send your data to ADSB.1 and ADSB.fi. From that one device, you can get like great service on all three of those different platforms. That's what I've heard. Yeah, you can you can actually 
you can send it to multiple services at once if you like. Uh, mm-hmm. There's nothing stopping you. There was, a, yeah, there was a little call out box on the Flight Radar 24 site that said uh, if you do plan to send data to other services, uh, you have to go into the config and disable um, something called MLAT. Not sure what that is. I don't know. It's, uh, yeah, so, yeah, so obviously they are cool with you, you know, sending data to other services. It's just inc- so fascinating. Like, this is, this is where I live in terms of technology. Like, when it, when it comes to doing anything that detects real world data or, you know, detects data over great distances, you know, networking, telecommunications, all that stuff, that's all really, really fascinating to me. So, I think I've been bitten by the SDR bug uh, <laughs> software to find radio. So, I want to see. Uh, what else you can do, basically? Because now that I have that kind of a proof of concept up in the attic, I, I know I can get power and network up there. So what else can I do? <laughs> Answers on the back of a postcard. Have you ever heard of Meshtastic? No. So Meshtastic is a... I don't even know exactly how to describe it. I'm not super familiar with it yet, but it's somewhat similar. You can install the software on a really cheap, low-power device, and it communicates with other devices with the same software installed, and it creates an open-source, off-grid, decentralized mesh network. So imagine you've got like three devices that are in a line at the very edge of each other's range. One device way over on the left can communicate with the device way over on the right, even though they have like no direct connection with each other, through that one in the middle. So the one on the right sends a message, the one in the middle receives it and relays it to the one on the right. Hmm. And you can just set up huge mesh networks like using these devices. And it's um, there's another protocol called LoRaWAN, which is long range ah. wireless access or wide area network long range wide area network looked into this and this does the same uses the same LoRa technology long range technology but it doesn't create an internet it's just a mesh network specifically for these devices yeah that's uh, that's very interesting i did think of doing that as well um because i you know i've got a bit of a a prepper tendency in me you know i'm always like planning yep. for the apocalypse <laughs> and stuff so <laughs> that's exactly what i why i've been interested in it too that's why I'm so interested in like amateur radio and, and software defined radio because it's like, well, you know, if the global communication network goes down, I'm on, I'm on my own. I got to fend for myself, you know. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I've been like, you know, I've been looking into like downloading like uh, snapshots of Wikipedia and stuff at regular intervals and stuff just mm-hmm. to have a hard copy of Wikipedia and everything, things like that. Um, but uh, and it is possible apparently, um, mm-hmm. and there's a, a huge community out there of people creating like doomsday computers and stuff like that that will work even without like like a grid, quote unquote mm-hmm. grid, um, like solar powered stuff and stuff that's like standalone access points and stuff in it, like fascinating shit. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I looked into L- Laura, Laura, and uh, it's it's a cool technology. It's I, I actually found that there's a, a really popular application for it in ireland anyway is uh farmers um, farmers use it quite extensively yeah yeah there's uh, a company I, w- uh, I worked for before one of our clients was um was a company that did this uh, essentially they did like a whole platform for farmers so they could put like uh these laura capable devices on say on gates between fields that they had livestock in and they could detect when the when the gate was open or closed they could uh I, I'm struggling to remember now all the applications for it, but like, yeah, it's it's apparently it's good for farmers because they can uh, monitor a lot of different things on their farm, like movement of livestock and you know, uh, like status alerts for different things and you know, moisture of the moisture in the soil, things like that. Uh, so there's a lot of applications for it there. Um, the I think it, it's limited in terms of like bandwidth. Uh, I think it's yes. like it's very high, like long range, but low bandwidth. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the packet size is quite small. Yeah, but it's still fascinating to me. I mean, I just do love the idea of having like an antenna array on my roof and just being able to access things in my house. Like if I have line <laughs> of sight, stand on a tall, the t- you know, top of a tall building in a hotel mm-hmm. in the city center or something and like communicate with the server in my house. I mean, that's a bit of a pipe dream, but... <laughs> 
but uh, if it's possible, I want to know how. Mm -hmm. I've heard a lot about emergency service organizations that like respond to natural disaster areas, exploring mesh network technologies because it would allow them to drop a few of these devices in strategic points in that disaster area and all of them would connect with each other and connect back to one central point so that one central point can relay messages across that entire very broad disaster area and get help to people. Hmm, that's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm actually looking at the website for this Meshtastic thing. This sounds really fun. <laughs> I, I don't know that they're specifically exploring Meshtastic. This is just like a, mm. a community thing I've been interested in for a while. Hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm definitely going to look at this. I'm definitely going to get this going if I can. Um, I'm, I'm just like, what I'm interested in here is like, what sort of like kit, like hardware that you actually need. So they recommend a few devices like the Raspberry Pi Pico, for example, and a lot of stuff from a company called Lily Go. I don't know anything about Lily Go, except that I actually have one of their devices sitting in uh, the uh, plant pot behind me <laughs> yeah i've definitely heard the name before um i think i looked into that when i was researching uh laura lauren yeah it's very interesting um the support does seem to be for devices like it seems to be i wouldn't say limited but uh, specialized let's say mm -hmm. you know it's definitely uh limited to uh like these L laura devices um I mean, if that's the protocol, I guess that makes sense. But like, I'm looking for something a bit more beefy. Mm -hmm. But it still looks like a lot of fun to try. Um, and I think I will have to spend a lot more money on this. <laughs> yeah, their starter kit is only $25, not including shipping. It's meant to be super affordable. I really love that idea, though, of a decentralized internet. For anyone who's seen that show, Silicon Valley, <laughs> that's that's kind of what he's all about. He's using like a really efficient co compression algorithm to like facilitate this peer-to-peer -peer internet, like that basically just uses everyone's phone as like servers. Sort of like the same idea as BitTorrent, I guess. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone everyone's data is stored on everyone's devices. It's a really fascinating idea, and it's actually amazing that it it popped up in like a HBO comedy. You know. <laughs> Um, so whoever wrote that knew their stuff. Meshtastic doesn't exactly facilitate a, a decentralized internet. As far as I'm aware, it's exclusively for just chat, passing text messages back and forth. Yeah, yeah, I was reading that. Um, still a fascinating idea, though, because like it's not going through the machinery of the internet, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. it's, it's going directly to your device. Mm-hmm. Or bouncing through some other devices along the way, yeah. But yeah, the, the actual infrastructure is all like, you know, citizen infrastructure, I guess you could mm -hmm. call it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I love that idea. I, I really love that idea of complete, like, computing independence. Um, it's really fascinating. And I think with, like, stuff like, you know, the, you know, you get, you get a, have a lot of protocols these days that are pretty beefy, so... Who knows? Who knows what we'll see in the next few years? You know, will we need data centers and, you know, the cloud and everything? Probably, mm -hmm. but whatever. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of money to be made off it, so of course they're going to keep it around. So yeah, uh, yeah. just to conclude then, watch this space. Uh, I think I will do a lot more with, with this uh, ADSB receiver. And um, yeah, if you, if you know of any cool tricks or, or you know, add-ons I can put on the Pi to make it do cooler stuff please let me know in the Telegram chat or email or whatever. Um, okay, next up, I am learning Go. Uh, I said this before, I think, on the podcast. I've talked about it a few times, but um, I'm really making a go of it this time. But it raised the question for me because, just to give a bit of background, I studied uh, computing years ago, like 10 years ago, I think. It was like 2015 when I graduated. Uh, my degree was information technology and information systems, which is quite mealy-mouthed if you ask me. You know, it should have just been computer science or something because it was essentially was just computer science. But uh, yeah, so I, I, I did like C in first year, then I did a bit of Python in a data analytics class. Uh, I did a machine learning class and stuff when we did Python. Um, uh, did a bit of Java, which I absolutely hated, um, but still somehow got an A in it. Uh, <laughs> um, and then uh, what else did we do? We learned, yeah, and then web languages, you know, a bit of JavaScript, HTML, all the usual stuff. 
but that was a hilariously out of date class. Uh, they were still teaching us how to create a page using tables out of H- in HTML. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's pretty terrible. Um, anyway, that's that's a different story. Um, so yeah, uh, ever since then, like I've I, my my I work in the tech industry, but I don't need to know how to code. Uh, it's like kind of operational kind of stuff. So yeah, like I do troubleshooting and stuff, but it's very it's much more end user kind of stuff. Um, mm-hmm. So I don't need to like understanding code it helps, but isn't a requirement. You know, if you want to lead, read like uh, stack traces and stuff like that, it, it comes in handy. But, um, you know, if you don't know it, it's all documented anyway. So you don't need mm-hmm. to actually understand it. Um, so, yeah, I haven't really done any coding since then, uh, just here and there. Um, but I want to take it a bit more seriously this time because I would like to change my career. So as someone like you who knows code and makes a living from it, like and other people listening might be curious about this as well like it's it's kind of hard to know where to even begin and it's kind of hard to know to what level you need to get to you know to be hireable or to actually start earning money off of it so yeah i was curious about that you know i'm I'm thinking six months to 12 months uh of just learning and learning (laughs) and then maybe i'll get to a, a stage where i can actually like be hired and and be uh and do it for a living, essentially. Uh, so I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, we talked a little bit about this on episode 76 of Linux Downtime, and we talked about it again, covering some feedback in an upcoming episode of Linux Downtime. <laughs> um, but I think it really depends on what you need to get out of it and networking, mm. as in social networking. What you need to get out of it, as in a college student just learning to program is going to have different financial needs from someone who already has a career that supports them. And for a college student, they can, they would probably be just fine having a couple of connections and getting a job somewhere without actually knowing how to code, because that's what happened with me. I was in, in a Linux user group. I mentioned, hey, I'm, I'm looking for a job. I'm experienced with systems administration, but I've never actually written much code at all. And someone said, hey, uh, we'll hire you. You can learn on the job. And that's how I learned Python. That is the only reason I know Python at all is because of that job opportunity, because I, I definitely said yes. And I've been working for them for two, three years, something like that. That's what I've heard as well. I have a friend who said something very similar. Uh, a lot of it's down to who you know rather than what mm-hmm. you know. But I think I would say, though, I think the marketplace is a little bit more competitive nowadays. And I think it's a little bit saturated. I mean, don't get me wrong. I know that developers are still highly in demand. But uh, at the start of the year, there was quite a lot of tech layoffs and stuff. So I think maybe that hurt the demand somewhat. But I don't know. I don't know for a fact. And I think these are, again, two, like, separate areas. One is the big corporate side of tech and and programming, and that's what experienced all the layoffs. But in my experience, the smaller, like, hometown development companies that I interact with regularly, they they didn't have any layoffs at all. They're still hiring just as um, urgently as they were before. I guess it's a, I guess it's just a skill that's, you know, it depends, I suppose, on, you know, the climate and where you are, you know, I don't mean climate as in weather, but, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. the, the economic climate where you are and, uh, you know, just what, what it is that you're specialized in and stuff, you know. So uh, my, my interest has always been low level programming. I, I don't like front end programming. It just does not interest me. Uh, I much prefer to like make something in Blender or GIMP or something and just create something visual like that rather than doing it with with code so i always despised css in college because it just it was always so fucking fiddly and tedious Mm -hmm. and i just i don't like i don't do tedious i like things to be very logical very straight very like precise you know i i don't like this like how to hack something into appearing on one side of the screen and you know you have like in css you have like this concept of floating that always mm-hmm. bugged the shit out of me. Um, you know, you have floating divs and stuff like that that will like kind of reorganize the, you know, responsive design, I think they call it. Mm-hmm. Is that the term? 
Yeah, yes. that always bugged the hell out of me. CSS has improved a lot since then. <laughs> if you were to get back into it, you might have a nicer time. Yeah, there's, there's, yeah, I think there's an awful lot more frameworks and stuff nowadays that make things a little bit easier for you. Um, you know, it's kind of exploded in the last five years, I think, uh, all this stuff. So I'm, I'm kind of focusing on Go at the moment because, like I said, low level stuff is just far more interesting to me. I just, mm -hmm. it's just like solving logic problems essentially and. I was terrible at math in school, or maths, as we say here. Um, I was uh, terrible at that in school, but once I left school uh, and I, w I, did, I did computer science in college, it was like, oh, when there's an actual real-world application for maths, it's actually kind of interesting. And uh, I kind of kicked myself that I didn't listen more in maths in school. And this is, this is a deeper thing, but this is my whole problem with education. It makes interesting things boring, yeah, and it just gets you to like rote memorization. Uh, just just learn this for the test and shut the fuck up. And it's like, no, no, no. You have to like, we're we're children, okay. You have to make it interesting for us, <laughs> and then we'll if you show us what cool things we can do with it, what real world things we can do with this stuff, then we're gonna be like ten times more engaged. So uh, that's my little gripe about the education system. But yeah, like. But with Go, what I love about it is uh, my favorite language in college was C, actually. I learned that in first year. It was just like a programming concepts kind of course that we did for a couple mm -hmm. of semesters. And it was essentially just teaching you all the f building blocks of any sort of programming in any language, you know, like iteration, uh, you know, assignment, all that stuff, you know, mm -hmm. the, 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 the concepts that you find in every language. And uh, the lecturer had actually written a textbook uh, on C that was used in a lot of Irish universities, so um, which was which was great, and he was a fantastic teacher. He was so good, um, and he really got you engaged in it and stuff. So that left me with a very positive view of C because he taught it so well, and mm -hmm. he taught it so effectively that we really got it. Like within a semester, I fully understood all these concepts, and I fully understood the practical applications of them. Now, something with C, like something like C, though, you have to add a lot of libraries on top of it to make it do anything useful you know, in the real world, but, you know, get, I'll get to that. <laughs> uh, same with Go as well. It's quite low level. It's quite like logical stuff, you know. Um, but again, like, I guess once you understand the language itself, then learning any libraries or frameworks that are built on top of it are going to be that much easier. But yeah, I guess it's like a lot of people who maybe want to get into this, uh, and I saw this in college quite a bit, there was a lot of people I was studying with who were not there because they were actually interested in it at all. They were only there because it was a lucrative career. And they didn't really have any interest in it whatsoever, which slightly bugged me. That's still very much the case. Yeah, I'd say it's even worse now. You know, uh, I'm a person who's very interested in the technology. and Obviously, I'm doing this podcast. Uh, I'm very interested in technology and in computing in general. So yeah, but I guess it's like the practical side of things, like the grubby capitalist side of things. It's like... <laughs> I need to know how to do X, Y, and Z to get hired by a company who's going to pay me money to do these things. That interest you mentioned is going to be a very big differentiating factor between you and everyone else. Because I know a lot of big companies are specifically looking to hire people who might not already understand the material, but who would be interested in understanding it. Because there are so many people who just like go through the motions, they apply what they've learned, they and they never learn anything more. They never grow because they don't have that interest or that natural curiosity. And hiring people who have that interest and that curiosity, that drive and passion is very difficult. I guess that makes sense, yeah. I remember speaking to uh, a guy who, who is a professional developer. Um, I think he does Java or Python, I'm not sure. Um, but I was talking to him and he said like there are companies that would hire you um he said like you don't necessarily like you don't necessarily need to know how to do it you just need to have the wherewithal you know you need to have the the, the underlying curiosity to learn it um mm -hmm. so yeah he said kind of the very same thing um but where are these companies? <laughs> That's what I want to know. <laughs> I haven't That's found where one the yet. networking part comes in. Get get out in like find a Linux user group. I mean, you already have one. <laughs> mm. Oh yeah, I suppose. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Put it out there that you're looking for a job. Maybe someone would be at one of those companies who would hire you. Yeah. Uh, I think it's an important uh, thing to talk about because a lot of people, I, I know I know some people who are so smart and they're so good at some, it might not necessarily be programming, but they're so good at a certain discipline in their spare time. And then they're working in like a supermarket for their day job. It's like, dude, you could get a, a really interesting job out of this. And they just don't want to do it because they don't want to make it like work. Mm -hmm. I can understand that. They want to do it because they like doing it, not because they have mm -hmm. to do it. And I can totally get that. And I used to have that uh, mentality. Like, uh, I know a lot about Linux. I know my way around the command line. I can spin up a server. I can, I can administer a server to some extent. But I don't really want to do it for a job, you know, because then it's different. I did do, briefly do some some work years ago um, where I worked with like, uh, I was like I was kind of a database analyst, kind something like that. It was basically a, for credit card transactions like QA for credit card transactions, essentially. And I needed to know how to work on the command line. And I needed to know how to query uh, uh, an MS an MS SQL database. Mm -hmm. But I didn't enjoy it because it was work. <laughs> right. Um, so that was kind of a weird thing. Like, because I, when I first got the job, I was like, oh, yes, this is so cool. Like, I get to do the thing I'm interested in for, for my day job. And then, then I just ended up not enjoying it that much. Um, so I don't know, maybe I'm barking up the wrong tree. <laughs> Making it an obligation or requirement can sometimes suck the fun out of things. For sure, for sure. But I think there is, there's a job out there for me somewhere, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. So I think we'll leave it there for this week. Well, this fortnight, I always say week, don't I? Uh, as usual, you can find all of our contact details at linuxlads.com forward slash contact. Uh, we're mainly active on Telegram. That's our main chat. You can email us on show at linuxlads.com. And we are on a few other things, but we'll just let you go to the contact page to find out what those are. If you want to discuss the episode, uh, most importantly, um, in a more long form kind of format, uh, go to forum.linuxlads.com where we always post like kind of uh, long, long form show notes. And uh, that's where we would prefer a kind of long form discussion um, because Telegram chat, it kind of gets lost sometimes. So in terms of uh, upcoming events, you can find us, uh, hopefully all four of us this time, um, at uh, the Ubuntu Summit 2023 in Riga, Latvia on November 3rd to November 5th of this year. And that's going to be a blast. So um, yeah, we look forward to seeing you there and seeing everybody there. I know Mike is going to be giving a talk on, was it Visidata? That's right. And I'll be giving a lightning talk on my Willow release tracking software that we talked about a couple episodes ago and i'll probably be drunk <laughs> <laughs> i think we'll all be at least a little bit drunk <laughs> um i don't know what the beer is like in riga but it was it was great in prague last time <laughs> it was. so on that note uh we will wrap it up and uh hopefully all four of us will be back on the mic next time so until then thanks for tuning in and see you next time adios bye bye should have looked that up. <laughs> Let me look it up right now. You can cut this out, Jake.